Good morning, St. B. We have the following announcements and opportunities. Uh, just an advisory, the office will be closed for Labor Day tomorrow. On September 4th, uh, fuel will be bagging from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And Ann's closet will be open from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, upcoming this week, on the 10th, uh, Ann Dora Circle meeting at 10.30 a.m. And Friday night, September 13th, will be the night circle meeting at 6.30 p.m. Uh, please note, Ann's closet needs your help. We're requesting donations of canned fruit, soup, and ramen noodles. On behalf of the families we help, we are eternally grateful for your kindness. The St. Bethlehem uh, UMW cookbooks are here. A big thank you to everyone who submitted recipes and also to those who've already purchased a cookbook. At $10 a book, they make a great stocking stuffer or gift. Anyone interested in purchasing a copy should make their checks payable to St. Bethlehem United Methodist Women. Uh, September 4th, uh, on Wednesday, a Bible study and the children's meeting will resume on uh, the regular Wednesday 6 p.m. routine. Please come and join the discussion as we continue the dive into what it means to be United Methodists. Uh, September 15th to the 20th, after worship on the 15th, Pastor Corey will be traveling to the Duke Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina to attend a continuing education seminar. She will be away through Friday, September 20th. Should any pastoral emergencies arise, please contact Margaret Fisher or the church office. Upper rooms are available at either sanctuary entrance to guide your daily devotion. And as always, please fill out your attendance pad at the end of your pew to let us know you were with us in worship this morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Reverend Corey Alexander Willette, and sometimes I forget to introduce who I am. But it is my joy to be the pastor here at St. B. A few additional announcements. First is that as we are traveling through the next 12 weeks through our Upward book, we are also going to be singing hymns from Charles Wesley. If you read your newsletter, you know that Charles Wesley wrote over 6,500 hymns. We will not be singing 541.6 hymns every Sunday. We will be singing like two to three. We will only be singing the ones found in our United Methodist hymnal, which is significantly less than 6,500. We will also each week be praying together the Wesley Covenant Prayer. John Wesley adapted this prayer from the Puritan tradition that was so important to his parents, Samuel and Susanna Wesley, and the life in the Epward Rectory. It informed his theology and his preaching. He expected the people called Methodists to pray this prayer at the beginning of each New Year as a way of remembering and renewing their baptismal covenant. When we pray this prayer together, we remember that we are baptized. We renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of our sin. We accept the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. We confess Jesus Christ as our Savior, trust wholeheartedly in his grace, and promise to serve him as Lord in union with the church. And we renew our promise to live as faithful members of Christ's church as we serve as his representatives in the world. And so I recognize that each Sunday is not necessarily the start of the new year. But my hope and my prayer is that as we read this together each week, it will speak to us in new ways. And I invite you to reflect on it throughout the week as well. This morning, we will be singing two of Charles' hymns. We will be singing, And Are We Yet Alive?, which Charles wrote in his 1749 collection of hymns and sacred poems. John Wesley included it in a collection of hymns for the use of the people called Methodists in 1780 at the beginning of the section titled, For the Society at Meeting. 
Sometime around the appearance in this 1780 collection, Wesley began using this hymn at the start of annual social meetings, a practice that has remained largely in use since. We typically open our annual conference gathering each year with and are we yet alive we will also be singing O thou who this mysterious bread and hymnologist richard watson notes the particular literary approach used by charles wesley he says the hymn was very carefully the hymn very carefully uses the story of the road to emmaus the two disciples are talking with the risen Christ, are mourning his death until he reveals himself to them. This hymn puts us, the singers, in a similar position. We are communing with Christ. As the disciples talk with him on the road, we mourn our separation from him, our human situation, until the veil is removed and we see him as they did. Each week, I'm going to give a little bit of a history about the hymns. And in the book, there are references to many of the hymns, many of which are not in our United Methodist hymnal. But I invite you to reflect on the words as they are written as we sing them and use it as part, just another tool as we journey together over the next three months. And now, and most importantly, whether this is your first time or you've been attending for years, whether you are strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. Holy One, and as we gather this morning to worship you, may we speak truth, so that our words may give grace to those who hear. You. May we pray in faith, so that our words may give grace to those who hear. May we sing with joy, so that our words may give grace to those who hear. May we listen with open minds and receptive hearts, so that your words may give grace to us to hear. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we sing together hymn number 553, And Are We Yet Alive?
to remain standing as we affirm our faith to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. you now to join me in praying together. I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. You may remain seated as we sing together, O Holy Spirit, Root of Life. It's in the faith we sing, number 2121. the Word, 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. The words of God for the people of God. You may be seated. This morning, we once again find ourselves seeking wisdom. Over the next four weeks, we will explore the way of wisdom through the platform of grace, the posture of humility, the practice of inclusivity, and the promise of love. This morning, we will take on the platform of grace. In our reading this week, the first chapter opened with a story of one of the author's friends who was telling about being, in his words, accosted on the street. But he was being harangued about whether or not he was saved. They were accusatory and judgmental. After the author tells his friend that not all Christians are like that, the friend replied by saying, they claim to follow Jesus. And while I don't really care, I know enough to say that they bore no resemblance to Jesus at all. No compassion, no understanding, no love, no grace. It was a lack of love and grace that triggered the spiritual renewal started by the Wesley brothers in the 18th century. And we definitely don't have to look very far to see this lacking today. And I could preach a whole sermon on the ways the church is lacking. But I'm not really interested in doing that today. Because I think we all kind of have a feel for it. Instead, I want us to be intentional about looking for and naming the places of grace and love that we find. As we explore the way of wisdom and this week the platform of grace, we will see that the Wesleys oriented their entire vision of life in Christ around the concept of grace. Grace is the platform and everything is built upon it. Every aspect of their theology reflects some facet of God's grace, particularly as we find it embodied in Christ. As Harper and Chilcote write, quote, grace connects people to God, people to people, and people to the world. And what we hear in the prologue of John's gospel is steeped in connection. 
the verses just after what we read this morning, verses 15 through 17 say, John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God, but the one and only Son, who himself, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with Father, has made him known. Out of the fullness of Christ, we have all received unbounding grace and truth. Jesus is grace incarnate. The Wesleys frequently use love and grace interchangeably. And it's in this revelation that we see a God who is only love, who desires our restoration and wholeness, who lifts up all people, who offers grace without restriction. And so when we proclaim that grace is free and unbounded, we are proclaiming that it is an antidote against any and all forms of Christian teaching that seek to restrict God's love and grace in any way. And when we think about it that way, I have to challenge myself with the question, of where have I been part of restricting God's grace? Where have I been one who says grace isn't for you, actually? And there are times that this happens because we are only human. As much Grace as we receive, we are not always able to return that. We restrict God's grace because we're afraid that if God's grace is for everyone, that means there's less for me. But the good news is that grace isn't a pie. There is not a finite amount of God's grace because God's grace is unbounded and limitless. And even in these moments where we feel like we have to hoard God's grace to ourselves, God's grace always acts in us to enlighten and convict and pardon and reconcile and restore and love. It invites us to search beyond what we have been taught, what we have thought to know. And as we search beyond this, we are reminded of the grace of creation and redemption that invites us into a new way of living. There is no scenario where we are to live without living into a life of grace upon grace upon grace. And there is no scenario where the Holy Spirit is working against us. The Holy Spirit is always working for us and with us. The essence of God is love, and grace is the way in which we experience that love in the world. And when we experience this love and grace in the world, it requires a reciprocal response. As John Wesley writes in his sermon, The Case of Reason Impartially Considered, he writes, as reason cannot produce the love of God, so neither can it produce the love of neighbor. 
And if any man truly loves God, he cannot but love his brother also. Gratitude to our creator will surely produce benevolence to our fellow creatures. If we love him, we cannot but love one another as Christ loved us. We feel our souls enlarge in love for every child of man. We can't rationalize our way into love. John Wesley spent a lot of time with the Puritans. That completely just left my brain. But he was on a boat with the Puritans, I'm pretty sure. And he watched on this boat as they prayed and they sat still and they were just in the stillness of God. And he was in awe of that because he had never felt that peace in God. But he wrestled with it later because there was no action that accompanied it. He was just, they were just sitting and thinking about God. But we cannot just think our way into God, into love of neighbor. It is something that we have to be constantly and continuously practicing. Because when we practice these things, we feel the change within our very being. This is a practice that connects us to one another, to God and to the world because it expands our understanding of who we are. It invites us to live into the fullness of love and grace. It invites us to ask ourselves the questions, questions that are also found at the end of the chapter. When and how have you experienced God's free and unbounded grace in your life? Where do you see God's grace at work in the world, both to create and redeem? When I think about creation and redemption, my mind automatically goes back to COVID. That first month of COVID, when everything was shut down and everything was the most unnormal it has ever been, when anxiety was high, when isolation was very real, I think about the way that creation started to come back. I think about the fish that return to the canals in Venice. I think about the return of the forest. I think about the way creation seemed to be healing itself as we were locked in our homes. And I'm not saying that being locked in our homes was a good thing for us. One day I will write a whole dissertation on the collective trauma that we experienced and dealt with. But we are always seeing the way that God is coming in and redeeming creation and redeeming us and calling us to be partners in this work. Marianne May Thompson says that calling Jesus God's word means, quote, he is God's self-expression, God's thought or mind, God's interior word spoken aloud. John portrays Jesus not only as the representative of God, but also as the representation of God the one whose origins lie uniquely in the very being of God. Jesus is God's love incarnate. Jesus is a full embodiment of God's grace. And when we ask ourselves the question, what are the marks of love and grace, 
we must always first turn to the life that Christ lived, the life that we are called to imitate. We also think of the fruit of the Spirit. We think about caring for those who have been marginalized by society. The marks of love and grace are always places of connection. When we are connected to God, when we are connected to one another, when we are connected to all the people of the world, to our neighbors, that is where we find love and grace. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers forward for this morning's offer. Let us pray. O oh God, pour out your spirit upon these our gifts, gifts that have been graciously given to us that we now humbly return to you. May they be used to connect with the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, we have several we want to lift up. We want to lift up Margaret King, who went to the hospital last week and is still at Tenova. We also want to lift up Lucille Thompson, who went to Tenova over the weekend. We also want to keep Robert and Mary Knightsky in our prayers. They were on vacation to Wisconsin and came back and now both have COVID. And so we want to keep them in our prayers as well. Are there other joys or concerns this morning? Welcome. We want to pray for Grace and Vicki who are traveling to Ohio to see a new baby brother who was born Wednesday? Tuesday. Tuesday. 
my mother uh, was raising who's on the list for a, a previous heart thing. Her brother had his first heart attack this week and gets to go home today. Uh, so he'll he'll have a kind of new lifestyle to get used to. So he's going to need some prayers. That's Fred Wright. We want to keep Fred Wright in our prayers. He is Doyle's uncle. And Rose Bearden, who has been on our prayer list, who we have been praying for, is her brother. He had his, he had a heart attack and is hopefully going home today. And so we pray for him as he adjusts to a new normal with this new life. And prayers for both of them as they do their rehab together. Yeah, they're neighbors. Are there, We want to pray for Jody, who will be traveling to Missouri on Wednesday to be with her sister, who is having surgery on Friday. Hopefully her stay gets to be short, as that means she won't be as needed as might be necessary. But we pray for her travels and for her sister's surgery. Whitney's daughter-in-law, Dana, will be induced on September 10th if baby does not come before then. And so we pray for baby and mom and, and dad in all of the adjustment and hope that both mom and baby stay healthy between now and then and after. Let us go to God in his prayer. Holy and loving God, God who is full of grace and love, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks that we have been able to gather together again. We give you thanks that we are a community who prays for and with one another. Oh God, we lift up to you the prayers that we have named. Prayers for health and healing. Prayers in the midst of recovery. Prayers for the anxiety of, with, that comes with anticipation as we await whatever is to come next. Oh God, we also lift up to you the prayers of our hearts. The ones we can't speak aloud. The ones we're unready to speak aloud. The ones that are beyond our words. Oh God, we know that you hear them just the same. Oh God, as we give you these, our prayers, we know it doesn't always take away the worry and anxiety we feel. But we do know that in all that we feel, in all that we experience, in everything that happens, we are not alone. 
for you have searched our hearts and there is nothing that we could do that would separate us from your love or your presence. So God, we ask that you continue to make your presence known among us. So that we feel your comfort and your peace and your everlasting love. We pray these things and all things. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to our time of Holy Communion, we are reminded that this is not my table. This is not St. Bethlehem's table. This is not the United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table. And at Christ's table, all are welcome, period. There are no exceptions. There are no ifs. There are no buts. This is Christ's table, and you are invited. This morning, we'll be taking communion. By coming forward, you'll be invited to kneel at the altar, and you'll be given a piece of, of bread and a small cup of juice. As you receive the elements, you're invited to take them. After with each group, I will dismiss you with a blessing, and you are invited to return to your seats. Any money that is left on the altar goes to our Helping Hand Fund, which goes to assist our neighbors in need. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Blessed are you, our Alpha and our Omega whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. 
and in you we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert us. You made covenant with your people Israel and spoke through prophets and teachers. In Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, who called you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced a people as your own and filled them with a longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit making us the people of your new covenant. On the night in which meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. That in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood. As the grain and grapes, once dispersed in the fields, are now united on this table in bread and wine, so may we and all your people be gathered from every time and place into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake in the one loaf, the bread which we break is sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is sharing in the blood of Christ. At this time, I invite those assisting with communion to come.
The table is set, and you are invited. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we come to the close of our service this morning, I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing together hymn number 613, O Thou Who Bist Mysterious Bread.
As we depart from this place, we go into the world knowing that we carry with us the fullness of love and grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So go in peace. Amen. Amen.